So thank you all so much for attending today. We're going to take questions at the end. So if you have any questions, just type them into the Q&A or the chat box, and I'll keep my eye open for those. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Emily Kyle, and I am an attorney here at the Kyle Law Firm, which you can see from my sign behind me. Um, and we practice in the area of special needs planning, estate planning, guardianships and conservatorships, um, trust administration, and probate matters. Um, we are in Scottsdale, and I'm just thrilled to have you all. We try to do these once a month um, on a Wednesday at noon. The, you can always call the office at 480-348-1590 to make sure you know what's coming up for our next um, Zoom webinar and what's on the calendar for the rest of the year. So thank you again so much for attending. I am going to let um, Nicole introduce herself from SARC. I've been involved with SARC for many, many years and am on their education committee, um, as well as the professional advisories committee, and I'm a a wholehearted supporter of the work that they do, both in research as well as the resources they provide to the community, the information that they have, and the services that they provide to families. So with that, Nicole, thank you so much um, for being with us today and giving us some of your time. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Emily. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today during your lunch hour. I'm excited to share some findings from a recent research study that uh, we just recently published. Um, so in terms of an introduction, uh, my name is Nicole Matthews. I'm a developmental psychologist and the director of research at SARC. Uh, and today I'll be talking about a study that we conducted on the transition to adulthood, um, and in particular, some of the insights we learned from young adults on the spectrum and their parents through that study. Um, before I get started, first, I want to just apologize in advance. I'm in between the end of a cold and allergy season, so <laughs> my voice isn't usually this raspy. I thank you all for dealing with it for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, I also want to just give a little bit of background information on SARC for those that might not be familiar. So SARC is a nonprofit community-based organization that was founded here in Phoenix 25 years ago. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary. Uh, we provide services for individuals on the spectrum throughout the lifespan. We start as young as six months with children who might be at risk for a variety of reasons, and we work all the way through the lifespan. So for example, right now we're doing a study on a program for adults who um, range in age all the way up into their 60s and 70s. Um, and I represent our research department. So our research department uh, has three main programs. We have our clinical trials program, our original research program, which I'll be presenting some findings from today, and then also our diagnostic services program. Uh, our overarching goal or our mission is to improve autism detection, evaluation, and treatment throughout the lifespan. Um, and so today I'll be presenting some more descriptive research that contributes to this goal um, that we undertook to help inform some of the programs that we are hoping to develop in the future. So I want to give you a roadmap of what I'll be talking about today. I'm going to start out with uh, some background about how we got research and some of the literature that was already published in the field. Um, then I'll talk about findings from the mixed method study that we conducted. Uh, and by mixed methods, I mean we used um, two different methods within the study. So we looked at both uh, data from standardized assessments that usually provide a, a numeric value. Um, these are assessments that you might see conducted by professionals when they're doing treatment planning. Uh, we also use them a lot in research to try to get sort of put a value on an individual's functioning in various areas. Um, but we also collected qualitative data in the form of interviews with young adults who had a diagnosis of autism and at least one parent of each young adult. Um, I will also talk about take home points from the study or what I think are the take home points, my interpretation of them. And then I'll spend a couple of minutes at the end talking about current research opportunities at SARC. Uh, so we encourage you to look more into those and share them with your network if there's something that is of interest to you. <clears throat> 
So I'll go ahead and get started with some of that background that I mentioned. Um, so about a decade ago, maybe a little bit more, uh, the field of autism research really started to come to terms with the lack of work that had been done on the experiences of people with autism in adulthood. Um, very little had been done there. Um, and what had been done was suggesting that outcomes for adults um, were suboptimal. So not only were they having outcomes that were poorer, for lack of a better word, compared to typically developing individuals or people without autism, um, they also were experiencing outcomes that weren't as great as other individuals with developmental disabilities, like intellectual disability or speech and language impairment. Um, so this is a screenshot from um, the National Indicators Report that came out in 2015 from Drexel University. You can see in terms of employment outcomes, young adults on the spectrum um, were faring considerably worse than some of their peers with other developmental disabilities. Um, also, one in five, if you look down here, had never lived independently from their parents in young adulthood. Um, and in general, they were um, experienced unemployment or underemployment at rates that were greater than what you would see in the general population. In the decade since, a lot more research has been conducted, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. Around the same time that that National Indicators report was published, um, we were doing some of our own research at SARC on adaptive functioning profiles um, in children, adolescents, and adults with autism. So we have a really nice resource at SARC. It's the, our lifetime database, and it basically has data from the last 25 years of research studies that we've been doing. Um, and we're able to look at that data in a de-identified way um, and analyze it to answer questions that would be important for the population and stakeholders. And so at the time, we were looking at this in uh, children. Um, we were looking at adaptive functioning profiles. And I'm going to be throwing that word around a lot, so I want to make sure that I define what I'm talking about. Um, many of you are probably familiar with adaptive functioning, but it's basically a set of skills that are age appropriate um, and thought to be necessary to live independently. So I have um, a few examples of domains that fall under adaptive functioning. So things like community use, uh, health and safety, self-care, self-direction, work. So vocational skills plays a big role here. Um, and the important part is that they're age appropriate. So you know, an infant is expected to have different adaptive functioning skills than a toddler. And same thing with a toddler compared to an older child or an adolescent or an adult. And when we measure adaptive functioning, this is reflected um, in the scores that we use because you're always being compared to your same aged peers. So you're being compared to what the average person of your age can do. Um, and so that will be important when I talk a little bit about our findings in just a minute. So we were doing this work with children and we noticed an interesting pattern um, in that children who did not have an intellectual disability. So these are children who had IQs of 70 or above. In the past, they may have been referred to as having high functioning autism. Um, they were showing a pretty large gap between their intellectual ability and their adaptive functioning skills. So in the general population, we expect to see intellectual ability and adaptive functioning sort of hanging together. So if you have an average intellectual IQ score, we'd expect you to have an average adaptive functioning score as well. Um, but in these children who were not intellectually impaired, we saw them having average to above average intellectual ability scores, but their adaptive functioning scores were falling well below their own scores and oftentimes in the impaired range. Um, so we wanted to look at this in adolescents and adults to see if this pattern persisted. Um, so we published a study back in 2015. We were able to utilize data from that lifetime database where we looked at intelligence scores and adaptive functioning scores from um, adolescents and young adults on the spectrum. And we replicated what we saw in young children. Um, so I'll orient you to this graph 
um, on the left of your screen. Uh, on the y-axis, we have standard scores on a measure of adaptive functioning. And um, 100 is average. That's what you'd expect in the general population an average score to be. And you can see here that for all of our groups, which we separated by intellectual ability, um, they were all falling well below average and their averages were actually below 70, which suggests disability or impairment. Um, and what's most notable is that there was no statistical significant difference between any of the groups, despite these pretty large differences in their intellectual abilities. So statistically, our individuals who had high or average IQs had adaptive functioning scores that were similar or the same to our individuals who were um, who had an intellectual disability. We also looked at this data by age group. So we separated participants into adolescents, young adults, and adults. Um, and over here, we have their IQs plotted. Um, again, this is a standard score where 100 is average. So you can see the average of the sample was around 90. Um, and you really see in this graph that gap between intellectual ability and adaptive functioning. So these are the adaptive functioning domains over here. And what was really striking to us was that the solid line, which represents adolescence, um, had a much smaller gap, a statistically significant, um, or which was statistically significantly different from the gap between our adolescents, or sorry, the gap in our adults. So we can see that it appears that as individuals age, the gap between their intelligence scores and their adaptive functioning scores are getting bigger. And this was mostly seen in communication and socialization scores, um, and it could be suggesting a stagnation of adaptive functioning skills with age. So it's not that these individuals are losing skills. It's not that one day they were able to brush their teeth independently, and then a few months later they weren't, right? Or by the time they got to adulthood, they weren't. It's that they are not developing skills at the same pace as their peers who are of the same age. Um, so there seems to be a stagnation of adaptive skill development happening. It could be also that this has to do with what has been referred to as the services cliff. So once individuals on the spectrum exit high school, um, they lose a lot of the services that they were receiving through high school in special education or with their 504 plan, and there's not a lot out there for adults. Um, so that could be contributing to this as well. So the implications of this work were, we thought, very important. Um, so basically, we saw this gap most pronounced in participants who did not have an intellectual disability. Um, so the biggest gap was in these individuals who had IQs of 70 or above and who were otherwise doing okay in terms of academics and their intellectual functioning. Um, we see this gap begin to appear around school age and we see that the impairments become more pronounced with age and it continues into adulthood. If you combine this with what we know that this population or this demographic of people with autism um, are even more underserved than people who uh, do have an intellectual disability, so oftentimes they aren't receiving publicly funded services or they might not be receiving special education at school. They might be focusing on academics and not really focusing on learning adaptive functioning skills in their high school years. Um, it's not really surprising that we see, see some of those suboptimal outcomes that I presented um, earlier on in the presentation. So uh, it, it makes sense that we see these delays achieving independence in adulthood. That research had some limitations. It was a cross-sectional design, which means we did not follow the same individuals over time. Uh, we looked at adolescents and adults at a single time point and compared their scores. So there could be some cohort effects happening here, meaning that the adolescents are potentially benefiting from services that maybe those adults didn't have access to. Uh, there has been some longitudinal research, though, that is consistent with our findings, so I'll just give a brief 
30 second summary. So uh, this group followed individuals um, ages seven to 23 over time and looked at their adaptive functioning. Remember, they're looking at a standard score, which compares them to their same aged peers at every time point. So it's essentially a moving target. Um, and what they found is the majority of their sample did not show improvements on their adaptive functioning scores. And uh, a small minority, but a, an important one, actually showed deteriorating scores over time. And what was really meaningful about this is these were individuals who were in treatment, so they were receiving evidence-based treatment. And it just speaks to the fact that uh, adaptive functioning expectations get greater as we age. So even if someone is developing skills, when you look at their skills compared to what is expected at that age, it might not, their skills might not be progressing at a pace that would put them sort of into that average range to where they're showing improvement on these measures. Uh, we also didn't get any information about what was causing this gap between adaptive functioning and intellectual functioning from the research that we did. And it sort of left us questioning, okay, well, what should we do with this information? Um, it could have been a number of variables. So executive functioning has been proposed to be behind this gap. Um, a lack of implicit learning in individuals with autism has also been documented. So whereas uh, the average person learns from their environment, there's been some research to suggest that people with autism uh, do not experience the same level of implicit learning. Intrinsic motivation was another um, factor that we identified, and there's certainly other factors that likely are contributing to these findings. So we were left wondering, like, okay, well, what do we do <laughs> to help uh, sort of bridge this gap and to help individuals as they transition to adulthood to develop the skills that they need to reach their own goals? Um, so that led us to the study that I'm going to spend most of my time on today. Um, we recently published a study in the journal Autism, and it is that mixed method study I was talking about um, at the introduction. So we really wanted to get more insight and more details and more rich description about what was happening with young adults as they transition to adulthood. So we recruited um, 21 young adults and their parents. Uh, the sample size was relatively small because this was a mixed method study and we were doing qualitative analysis with them. Um, we did a traditional battery of standardized assessments where we collected their IQ and then a parent report of adaptive functioning. And then we conducted these semi-structured interviews with the young adults and their parents. And we did these independently. So the interviews were about 90 minutes and we independently interviewed each young adult and then independently interviewed at least one of their parents. Um, this table just demonstrates uh, some of the characteristics of our participants. The note I want to make is that we over recruited for participants who had at least one year of consecutive employment history because we wanted to get a better understanding of um, what those individuals did to be able to successfully achieve and maintain employment. Um, the other half of the sample had limited in employment history. So the majority did not have any employment history. Um, a couple had a few months. So the most employment history that this group up here had was about four months. And then if you look at this sample, it shows the group demographics. So the average age of participants with autism was 24 years. 81% um, of the sample was male, which is consistent with what you'd expect with current prevalent estimates. I do want to point out that the sample was predominantly Caucasian and middle to upper middle class, um, which is unfortunately consistent with most research in general. Um, so certainly these findings should be taken with a grain of salt and additional research needs to be done um, that it includes more racial diversity, socioeconomic diversity, so that findings can be generalized to those groups as well. So I will spend just a minute or two on our quantitative findings. So we because we wanted to see, well, does this sample of participants show this gap between intelligence and adaptive functioning that we observed previously? And they did. So you can see here the average IQ was 
um, 100 or close to 100, and we saw a 20 point gap or more between IQ and these different domains of adaptive functioning using a different measure than we had used previously. Um, so this really sort of adds support to the evidence that there is this gap between adaptive functioning and intelligence in this demographic of young adults. And then moving on to the qualitative findings where I will spend most of my time talking. Uh, so to analyze these, we used a common method in qualitative analysis called grounded theory methodology. And the goal of grounded theory methodology is to develop a conceptual model that is grounded in the data. So in this case, our data were those responses that participants gave to the interviews that we did with them. Um, so myself and two very dedicated undergraduate research assistants coded pages and pages and pages of transcripts from these interviews, um, and we coded them line by line, uh, assigning codes to the different fragments of data, and then going through an iterative process where we categorize the codes um, into, you know, smaller codes and, and used a hierarchical structure to get to the con conceptual model that you see on the screen. Um, so these were really sort of the main themes that we saw in the data. Um, I will come back to this graphic of the conceptual model. I'm going to sort of break it down and talk through each, but I want to make a couple of notes before I do. So in this method, um, core categories, which you'll see at the top, are thought to be themes that really transcend the data, transcend the responses of your participants. You sort of see them across participants and across the different things they're talking about. And then you have main categories, which are other really sort of uh, prevalent themes themes that you're observing in the responses of your participants. So I'll start with that core category, um, which we termed living interdependently. So I'm assuming many people in this webinar have um, experience with autism and experience with developmental disabilities. And so the term independence is probably one you hear quite frequently. Uh, functional independence, facilitating independence, that's really what the goals of IEPs and treatment planning are. Um, you may not have heard so much about interdependence. Um, however, if you Google independence and autism, up there in the top five uh, is this article written by a stakeholder. Um, this person has autism, has a child with autism, and she's making the argument that there's danger in pursuing an independence as a goal for uh, young adults on the spectrum. Interdependence is a term that has been around for decades. So uh, in the 90s, it was brought up in the, re in the disabilities research field. And it's really an alternative to the concept of independence. And the reasoning is that most people, regardless of their disability status, don't live in a vacuum and they rely on others and they rely on resources in their community. We really are all interdependent. And so why would we set as a goal um, for individuals with disabilities to have independence as their goal? So some examples here, most significant others or even roommates share household responsibilities. Most employees have workplace mentors or they're working on teams or maybe even across teams. And a really prevalent example would be grandparents or other family members helping with childcare. So interdependence is really something that we all experience. Um, and it's something that we observed in the responses of our participants. And again, it's this core category, which means we thought across all participants and across all of our other categories. So all of our young adults demonstrated indicators of independence, um, although they had varying degrees. So we had some young adults who really were close to independent in many realms um, or many of these sort of adult milestones that you would expect adults to achieve. So vocational independence, residential independence, financial independence, um, but they still were drawing on a support system. There were instances of them requiring support from their parents or from their community. Um, and then, of course, at the other end, we had adults who were requiring a lot of support. So we saw a lot of variance in our sample. Um, examples of support would be support from parents and other family members, from workplace mentors, interpersonal relationships, so both friendships and romantic relationships, and then public supports like social security. <laughs> 
So now I'll go on to those main categories that I talked about. There were four of them. And the first one really was reflecting the complexity of this concept of adaptive functioning. Excuse me. So when I introduced adaptive functioning earlier, I shared that it's usually measured with a standardized measure that yields a numeric score that sort of shows where someone is falling on what we call a normal curve and whether or not they're falling in um, the impaired or dis disabled range. And what we learned from the responses from our young adults and their parents was that um, it's a lot more complex than that. It's a lot more complex than the single number. So we had some young adults who might have been scoring relatively high in a domain. So for example, in the domain of health, and then some of the responses from that young adult or their parent indicated some real challenges in that area, even though that number was reflecting that they were doing okay. Uh, the opposite was also true. We had some young adults who were scoring relatively low in a particular domain, but then responses sort of highlighted these areas of real strength that we weren't getting from these numeric scores. Um, all of the young adults in our sample were master or managing some skills independently. So even though what I talked about earlier sounds really scary, you know, we see this huge gap between adaptive functioning and intellectual functioning, it doesn't mean that they're not managing some skills independently. Um, and again, there was a lot of variance here. So some adults were managing quite a few skills independently, where others um, not so many. We also saw fluctuating mastery of skills. So young adults and their parents talked about how at one point in either adolescence or young adulthood, they were demonstrating independence in a particular area. And then um, later on, they sort of lost independence. And oftentimes this was due to environmental factors. Um, what we referred to as an interruption to independence. So an example that comes to mind for me was a young adult who was living independently in a different city from his parents. He was working independently, but his quality of life wasn't great. His health wasn't great. And together with his parents made the decision to move back so that he could go to school. So he went from living independently to living with his parents and not working, but he was working toward a, a larger goal to improve his own quality of life. So even though in his quantitative scores, it was reflecting maybe his lower adaptive functioning, he was doing it for a reason um, to develop skills for the future. Another example of this comes from uh, the parents of one of our participants. So um, they talked about how he had a a good job that he had maintained for multiple years. They had given him some money to invest. And I just want to point out Matt is a pseudonym, as are all the other names that I'm talking about to protect their anonymity and confidentiality. Um, but they went on a long-term vacation and while they were gone, he donated his life savings to their church. And so that really set him back. It was an interruption to his own independence um, and really their own interpretation of his financial management skills. Uh, the last theme that we saw in this category was the interconnectedness of adaptive functioning skills. So oftentimes, um, a, the level of independence in one area really heavily influenced the capacity for independence in other areas. Uh, we most commonly saw this with transportation. So this is demonstrated by uh, Liam, who shared that he doesn't feel he can be independent in making his own um, health care appointments and managing his own health care appointments because he needs to get a ride from his mom to go to all the health care appointments. And so it really doesn't make sense for him to, man or to schedule those on his own since it needs to work with her calendar. And we saw a number of other instances um, with transportation influencing other areas of adaptive functioning, but certainly there were other areas as well. The second uh, main category that we observed was the category learning how to live as an adult. So in this category, young adults and their parents described basically the methods by which they learned these adaptive functioning skills that we were asking about. Uh, many young adults talked about how they learned from experience, so they needed to experience independence to be able to develop some of these skills. So uh, Ava demonstrated this when she shared that living independently helped her learn how to budget and manage her money. 
Uh, we also had young adults and their parents talk about support from formal services. So uh, oftentimes this was during adolescence and in high school when they were receiving services under their um, IEP um, through special education. But sometimes this also um, went into adulthood through things like vocational rehabilitation, also through different transition programs. Um, but notably, a, a good portion of our sample did not report the support from formal services because they did not have access to them. And I'm going to talk about that in a later category. And then the last one that we found really interesting was a handful of adults and their parents talked about how romantic relationships actually seem to be the catalyst for new skills. So things like meal preparation or hygiene. Um, so really all of these experiences um, or lived experiences leading to the development of new adaptive functioning skills. Our third main category was balancing helpful and harmful parent involvement. This was um, a really prevalent category in terms of the support for it from the responses from our participants. Uh, we saw a number of examples of parents actively teaching adaptive functioning skills and this varied in intensity. So an example of a high intensity uh, peer, uh, teaching um, experience between a parent and a, and a young adult uh, was a mom who talked about how they had a schedule and the mom was essentially the job coach and working with the young adult on how to get an interview, how to prepare, how to follow up, how to do all of those things you need to do to get a job and to keep a job. And she talked about how she felt like she had to do it because there was, there were no supports out there for them at the time to be able to prepare for um, vocational placement or sorry, vocational experiences and for these other milestones of adulthood. Uh, we also saw this with less intensity, so it could have been something like the parent having the young adult fill out forms at the doctor's office when they go with them, or it could have been the parent teaching the young adult or even the adolescent how to do laundry, um, and then sort of slowly fading their support and then requiring them to do their own laundry. Um, but there was a lot of talk about these sort of I guess you could call them informal teaching experiences from the parent. Um, we also had parents who talked about how they set expectations for their teens and their young adults. And um, conversely, we had parents who talked about how they felt that they wished they would have set more expectations um, and that they wish they would have been better at sort of following up on those expectations and holding their teen or young adult to those expectations. Um, so this is e exemplified by Luke's mom, who, this is one of my favorite quotes, shared that um, when he was getting ready to leave high school, she told him he had to get a job or go to school or enlist in the Navy or something, but he's not going to stay at home and be a professional video game player and Cheetos eater. So really sort of saying, you know, here are these expectations that are reasonable, will help you get there, um, but you, you're going to do something when you leave high school. And then last, we saw examples of parents preventing autonomy. So this was reported both by young adults and also by parents. So some parents reflected back and wished that they hadn't been so involved and had not been so controlling of certain things. Um, so this example comes from Emma, who shared that her parents take control of her banking accounts and her apps, and that she felt like she really needed control of that to be able to learn how to manage her own money. Um, this is a theme that has been documented in previous qualitative research. It's um, been sort of depicted as a challenge for parents to transition from a spot where they are parenting a child and a teen um, and knowing how much autonomy to give their young adult because, of course, they want to keep them safe and keep them from succumbing to various vulnerabilities. So um, this was a really interesting and important one, and I think it take-home point um, from the research that we did. Our last main category was overcoming obstacles to autonomy. Um, this was another one that was very prevalent in the responses of our participants. So I'll start first with what the various obstacles were that they reported. Um, so core symptoms of autism were identified as an obstacle in getting a job. So it really sort of made it difficult to get through the interview process. Also keeping a job. Um, so some social challenges or 
restricted behaviors or repetitive behaviors um, often made it so young adults had challenges keeping their jobs. Anxiety symptoms were highlighted by many of our young adults as a large barrier to achieving their own goals. Um, it, they identified it as really getting in the way of them working toward the goals that they wanted to achieve. Um, and anxiety is a very common co-occurring condition for autism. So this is likely something that um, is going to be relevant for many individuals on the spectrum as they transition to adulthood. Executive functioning challenges were identified by many of our young adults, in particular um, as they pertain to driving. So this was identified by some of our young adults as the reason why they don't feel safe or they don't feel that they could drive independently. Uh, different levels of intrinsic motivation. So the young adults in the sample who had high levels of intrinsic motivation tended to be the ones who were most successful in achieving independence in uh, vocational and residential realms. Um, whereas those who self-identified as not having motivation, so these are young adults saying, I just don't have the motivation to do it, um, were facing more challenges there. Unrealistic job and career expectations were reported um, both by the young adults and by parents. And then we also observed varying levels of insight into their own skill set. So we asked all of our young adults, you know, what, what do you think you need to do to achieve your goals that you have right now? Um, and some of them knew exactly what they needed to do, whereas others responded they, they really didn't know. They were unsure what they needed to do and work on. And then last, I alluded to this earlier, um, a number of unmet service needs were identified. Um, and then two sort of sub themes from that were um, young adults and their parents felt like there needed to be more support related to uh, developing self-advocacy skills and then safety skills. Also in this subcategory, we had some um, strategies to address obstacles to independence so or to autonomy. Um, the first was goodness of fit. This is another um, sort of theme that has been captured in other qualitative studies. And the idea here is really striving for a good match between the young adult and their environment. And when I say environment, I mean everything from their roommates to the uh, residents that they're living in, to their workplace, and even the city that they're living in. So things like um, not having access to public transportation, not qualifying for publicly supported transportation, um, and then not having anyone to be able to take them places they needed to go, that was a real barrier for them to be able to achieve their goals. Um, whereas individuals who lived in an area where they could use public transportation had a lot more options available to them in terms of pursuing employment um, and being able to use the community how they wanted to. Uh, many participants also talked about workaround solutions. So these were related to skills that the young adults had been working toward becoming independent in for quite some time and just had not been able to do. And so uh, the young adults usually together with their parents thought outside the box to find a solution. So an example that comes to mind was a young adult who was living in their own um, house, but really could not keep up uh, the cleanliness of the house and ran into some hoarding challenges. And so together with uh, the young adult's parent, they decided that he would budget um, to have a professional cleaner come in regularly, and that would come out of the money that he was earning. Um, we had many young adults and their parents talk about how they felt good enough. Um, for many, this was feeling good enough for now. So, you know, they realized that there was more room to grow, but they felt good in their current situation. Um, but for some, it was feeling good enough just in general. So Dan um, shared that he was really happy with the position that he is in, even though it might not be to his parents' standards. Uh, and then last, we had many participants talk about benefits of overcoming their obstacles and achieving independence. So um, one example of this comes from Mike's mom, who shared that a lot of his skills improved since he started working. So not just vocational skills, but social skills and executive functioning skills. Um, and she also felt that he was depressed when he wasn't working. So she was really seeing the benefit of him overcoming these obstacles and achieving independence. <laughs> 
So now that I've gone through all of those categories and provided all of that information, I'll bring us back to this conceptual model that we were aiming to develop through this study. Um, and I just want to point out that those different categories um, we propose have bi-directional relationships with each other. So for example, if you look at the complexity of adaptive functioning, an individual uh, might have fluctuating levels of functioning on a certain skill within adaptive functioning. Um, and that's going to influence the level of parent involvement, right? Um, but at the same time, the level of parent involvement influences the level of adaptive functioning that a particular individual has. Um, and so we, we saw those sort of bi-directional relationships between all of these uh, main categories that were identified. So my take home points or my interpretation of these findings of what I think could be helpful in terms of planning for the transition to adulthood. Um, one consideration could be to plan for interdependence in adulthood rather than independence. So instead of identifying this really lofty and maybe like nebulous goal that's hard to define of independence, thinking about what are the individual strengths and then where are the areas where they might need to draw on their support system in adulthood. Um, developing personalized goals for the individual, so focusing less on these numbers that we get from standardized assessments, not completely disregarding them, but also considering the individualized goals of the young adult, um, and really focusing on those as you prepare for adulthood. Aiming for helpful parent involvement, which is easier said than done, um, but working toward a healthy balance of setting reasonable expectations, but also allowing opportunities for the young adult to develop some of these skills that they're going to need. Um, you know, I, I, a quote comes to mind from one of the parents, and she said, you know, I feel like we just have to let them try. It's going to be scary, but we have to let them try. So trying to find areas where it's reasonable to let um, young adults be able to go out and be independent and in practicing some of these skills. Aiming for goodness of fit, so really thinking about all of the different environments that the young adult will be in um, and trying to find a way to make it a good fit for them. And then having the expectation of obstacles and setbacks. Um, I know personally in my life as a person who is not on uh, the autism spectrum, I experience obstacles and setbacks all the time. Um, and so it's reasonable to think that uh, individuals with autism will also experience those and that's okay. Um, so knowing that they might achieve independence in certain areas and then they might face obstacles there in the future. Uh, and really sort of thinking about what sort of workaround solutions could be utilized to try to maximize independence, but also allow individuals to draw on their support networks. So I just want to take a minute and acknowledge the participants who participated in this study and thank them for their participation. I also want to acknowledge the co-authors on the study, two of which were undergraduates at the time but are now both pursuing careers in autism or developmental psychology, which is really exciting for them, and my collaborator, Dr. Christopher Smith at SARC, um, and also the other SARC research staff and interns who contributed to this work. Like I said at the beginning, I was going to do a quick plug for current research studies at SARC. Um, so this is just a few of them. I'm going to share our website in a minute where you can learn about other opportunities, but we really have something for all ages. Um, so first, we have our SPARC study. We are one site for the SPARC study, which is a national genetics study um, for people on the spectrum of all ages. Uh, the Envision study is for individuals with an uh, autism diagnosis ages 13 to 35, and it's looking at an investigational med medication that targets social communication and decreasing repetitive behaviors. We also have the tapestry study that we're recruiting for ages 13 to 17. Um, this study targets, it's another investigational medication that targets uh, gut microbes, focusing on irritability and anxiety. And then the Inker study, children um, and adolescents ages 5 to 17, another investigational medication focusing on reducing irritability associated with autism. Uh, like I said, we have so many other opportunities. So our website is autismcenter.org. If you go to discover what we do and then choose the autism research tab, you can see all of the studies that we're currently recruiting participants for. So please feel free to take a look and share with your network if interested.
And with that, I want to thank you all for listening. And I will uh, check in with Emily to see if any questions have come in. So that was amazing. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, just so <laughs> interesting in a different way to sort of think about things that inter the independence versus interdependence. And I, I think you're right that we, we are all part of a community, big or small, that we rely upon to make it through every day. So it would make sense that that same expectation would be for um, kids on the spectrum as well, instead yeah. of expecting them to be, be in a bubble out there in the world and they're still, <laughs> they have to sink or swim. Yeah, it's a scary goal if you frame it in independence. <laughs> so interdependence is much less intimidating. <laughs> Definitely, absolutely. So there weren't any questions. There were thank yous for a wonderful um, presentation. Uh, in the just a couple minutes we have left, I was wondering, one of the first slides where you showed um, intellectual, um, you know, IQ level and then adaptive functioning, is that also a study that was done on um, kids who have more average IQs? Because I'm thinking about like your average teenager, no matter how smart they are, seem to also have some adaptive function issues. So <laughs> I was curious if there was a comparison. Yeah, that's a great point. And adults too, I'll say. Um, so yes, these were, and I'm trying to reverse my slides, but we had a range of IQs in that sample. Um, and so we were doing that study on individuals of all different levels of intellectual ability. There we go. Um, so, you know, we had individuals in the intellectual disability range all the way to what would be considered the gifted range. Mm -hmm. um, what I'll say to your comment about, you know, individuals without autism having their own adaptive functioning challenges, that's sort of taken into consideration in those standardized scores. Um, so what they do when they develop these measures is they essentially collect data on a really large sample, usually nationally representative, and they see See what the average teenager is doing um, and so that's sort of taken into consideration there and that's why it's a moving target because by the time you get to adulthood hopefully your adaptive functioning skills um, are a little bit better and so it's harder to be considered average as an adult than it is as a teenager did that answer your question it did it did thank you very much i'm i'm not in research at all so i appreciate the explanation of the slides it's really helpful yeah of course so there was one um, question about where SARC's located and whether services are covered by insurance or um, if you know, because I know you're in the research department and not so much in the services, uh, how somebody would access um, the programs and services provided by SARC. Yeah, I can try my best to field the question. So um, we, our main locations are in central Phoenix, um, but we do have a goal for by 2030 to uh, have 10 locations throughout the valley and that, and we've been working toward that. So we have a few satellite campuses um, in Tempe and in South Scottsdale, uh, where we have some of our preschools and some of our individualized services. Um, we, depending on the program, we do take insurance. Um, so some of our programs are private pay only um, and are maybe short term, whereas our more comprehensive programs do take insurance. We have um, a family services team that is great at working with families to see sort of what is covered by insurance. If you go to that same website, autismcenter.org, and go to, um, it, it'll be I'm not sure what it is, but I think there's a section for contact us or family resources and you call that number and let them know what you're interested in. Um, they'll be able to sort of guide you through that process. Okay, and one last question. Um, somebody's asking what steps SARC might be taking to increase the racial and socioeconomic pool of participants um, in research and what you guys are doing as outreach. Yeah, it's a, it's a million dollar question. It's something that we've been working on and we continue to work on. Um, we actually have a really great team of recruiters and this has been identified as one of their primary goals um, where they're reaching out to more non-traditional events that might not be autism specific and might be more oriented toward um, different cultural groups and socioeconomic groups that are underrepresented so that we can try to improve awareness of autism and reach families that we haven't been reaching in the 
the past. Um, we're also doing a number of initiatives to reach out to the Spanish speaking community in Phoenix to hopefully not only increase diversity in our research samples, but also increase um, screening and awareness of autism and lower the age of diagnosis and identification in that demographic. So we have a lot of work to do um, and we, we're trying, you know, and we're constantly building on these initiatives. It is a, a challenge that all researchers have and the autism field is sort of looking in and realizing we need to do better. So um, hopefully, you know, over the coming years, it will be something that we will do better at. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. As I said at the beginning of the program, um, the this um, webinar will be on our website. So you can certainly review it there or let friends and family know that it's here. I think the information is just amazing and the tips to help parents kind of maybe reframe how they're thinking about their interactions is just phenomenal. Our website is kylelawfirm.com, K-I-L-E lawfirm.com. Um, and I just, I can't thank you enough, Nicole, for spending this time with us, plus all the work that you and your team are doing to get information and figure out ways that we can be more helpful um, to this certain population. So thank you so much. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for joining today. I couldn't see anyone, but I see some <laughs> familiar names in the chat. So I just want to say hi to everyone if I know you. <laughs> and thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. Thank you to all of our participants for being here. And um, we wish you the best. Stay healthy and um, take care. So thank you so much. Thank you.